purity of mind that it is like a conquering something and finally it comes up to the total capitulation that you are totally flat and bow down to surrender to what is higher than you are. I'm honestly not qualified to answer that. Everything in my life happened very spontaneously by grace. There is no one that claimed that any of my action or discipline resulted in anything which is present here. So I will hopefully ask someone else to answer you. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> it, it's interesting. Um, when Mount Everest was first uh, cli when, uh, first person that climbed it, in the Western world, the newspaper said, man conquers mountain. In the Eastern world, the newspaper said, man befriends mountain. It was two different perceptions based on worldview. In the Western world, we conquered the mountain. But in the East, it was like we befriended the mountain. Now, the inner work that we do does ultimately lead to a letting go, not a conquering other than, um, we can't say conquer the ego, but we could say it stops running the full show. And we're surrendering, allowing that which already is to begin to have its way in us. It's a surrendering to the next stage of our own unfolding. That's God within. We're surrendering not to God, the innermost God and the uppermost God are the same God. We're surrendering to the next level of our own unfolding. So you fell on Mother Earth, and your placebo consciousness said, this Mother Earth is taking care of me. And because that's where you were living, you were, you, you, you were able to have more life. That's how I hear what you're saying to us. So yeah, we all end up in surrendering, but we're surrendering to the next stage of our own unfolding and allowing something to take place. We can't earn that grace. We can't earn it, but we can uh, make ourselves receptive to it. Yeah. That's how I hear what you're saying. A few years ago, there was a very beautiful woman came to sit at the feet of my master, Papaji and she folded hand in the most beautiful way and she said please help me to see god how can i see god and papaji kept quiet and he told her make yourself so beautiful so humble that god can't resist Just make yourself so quiet, so beautiful, so humble. God can't resist. As my brother mentioned about God can't resist, I I wanted to share a beautiful teaching about God can't resist and what is it that God can't resist that we're given in the Ramayana, in the scriptures, in the story of God in the form of Lord Ram. Because we're offered two very different women who are in love with Lord Ram. And one is Sorpanaka, the demoness, but who's beautiful with all of her powers and all of her mantras and all of the, that shakti that she uses to make herself absolutely beautiful. And she approaches Lord Ram, be with me. I'm the one for you. He's not interested. He sees it as the, the trappings of just external 
makeup, an affectation, untruth. And then there's Shabri. The village woman, impoverished, with nothing. But who loves Lord Ram so much that every day, three o'clock in the morning, she wakes up and she's sweeping, sweeping, the doorway to her home and every street that comes to her home because she doesn't know which way is Lord Ram going to come. Just sweeping, sweeping, sweeping. No makeup, no jewelry, no fancy clothes, no nothing. But a love that is so pure and so devoted that she knows and the song that she sings says, today, today is the day that my, today is the day that my hut is going to be blessed. Today is the day God is coming, arriving. It is already. And every day she sweeps and she sings. Today. And Lord Ram arrives. And this is, this is scripture, canon, truth given to us. It's not about the decoration. It's not about the power. It's not about the shine. It's about the heart and the devotion and the love and the awareness that it already is. And as in your, in your vision, in your dream, that which originally you thought was mud, you realized was holy dust, is that opening to that which is. Not something to be pushed away. Not a darkness that's wrong or bad. Not something I need to cover up with a whitening cream. But actually that, that holy dust. Because all of it is a manifestation of the divine. And in that love and in that humility, know that yes, God is coming down the path. Sweep it and get ready. We have time for one more question. I was going to get his one. Oh, he wanted to. Actually, he actually asked me before, so I'm going to bear with me one second. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. I, so there's a story which I'm hearing since childhood. And uh, my question is uh, on that only. So the story I heard that there was a village which was suffering from flood. And a man went to a temple with a hope, with a prayer that, yes, uh, my God will save me. Then the flood level increased. He, climbed the, he actually climbed the temple. And with the hope, uh, the God will save me. So people, people brought the bullock cart to take him away. He said no. Then people brought the boat, and he said no. And then even the army also came and brought a helicopter. He said no. Finally, he died. He reached heaven, and then he asked God that, uh, why didn't you save me? I prayed so hard for you. And God said that, I sent you three help, and you said no. So my question is, I strongly believe that when we pray, there is an action from the, or, or like we, we should get a direction. So how to realize that what's the direction to act as God's guidance as we prayed? I hope my question is relevant. Shall I repeat the question? That intersection between prayer and action. So we're praying to God to save us, but 
the boat comes, how do you know whether to jump in? Has God <laughs> sent this boat? Is this God's helicopter? <laughs> when do you just keep praying and when do you? <laughs> my, my beautiful brother, in, 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 uh, in Sufi, we say, Kullu min Allah and Shwaya min Abdallah. Means it's all from, everything is from God. But little bit from Abdallah. Means, again, the ego is very subtle, very manipulative, and very tricky. So one can rest in this spiritual arrogance. Oh, only God is, He will help. I have to do nothing. And God is sending bullock cart, people, helicopter. And in our spiritual arrogance, we are missing what is right here in front of us. Everything is God. There is no separation. Any spirituality that separates that create a distance as if the world is not an extension of God itself. It's another trap. I hope it's helpful. Thank you. We have somebody who wants a very quick question. Do we have time, Sabaji? Of course. We are here only. <laughs> Hello. My name is Anthony, and I'm from Canada with this amazing team. And long story very short, to make it quick, our part of our dharma is to bring spirituality, prayer, all of this to younger crowds. And so... I feel like we're all really in tune with what you're saying here, but part of what's in common with everyone in the room is that we're all slightly older. So I'm curious to know, in the same way that Tesla made electric car revolution happen faster by making electric cars like sexy and cool, uh, what, what would you like to say maybe to help understand how to bring spirituality and prayer to younger crowds and Because of your beautiful answer now. So, thank you very much. So, uh, what I have seen is youth in general, and especially the youth today, they are really tuned in. This is a youth that has been born and raised with more technology, more distraction from technology than any generation ever. And perhaps because of that, perhaps because of the way that evolution has worked with that, they are actually more tuned in to that which is real and true and hypnotized, I have seen a lot of the technology than, say, their parents. When you speak about getting them excited about spirituality, the only way to do that is to ensure that the spirituality we model is real. Because these youth, we were just speaking amongst ourselves yesterday, that these youth have got an extraordinary BS meter. Like no generation I've ever seen. And they don't want any of it. And so they're not going to do things just because you say so. Because I say so is no longer an acceptable answer. Because it's the right thing to do is no longer an acceptable answer. Which means that we as those who are teaching, parenting, mentoring, guiding the youth, we grounded in truth before we try to give it to them. And if we are, 
And it's an extraordinarily beautiful challenge for all of us because what it means is long before we try to tell them get connected to God, come to temple, come to church, pray, we better be sure that when we walk out of temple and church and prayer, we are someone they say, I want to be like that. Because when we walk out and we get in the car to go home from temple or church and we're complaining or we're gossiping or the only thing we can think to talk about is how so-and-so seems to have gained weight or so-and-so is wearing some expensive diamonds and why don't I have expensive diamonds and you know, you made us late. Why in the world would these kids have any interest in anything that that temple or church has to offer. And so we have to be sure that we are embodying in a way that is real, that is true, that is transmitting something. And that's an extraordinary challenge. in our spirituality to not be stuck. It doesn't have to be the way we did it. It doesn't necessarily have to be organized the way we organized it. But to help them understand that all of that exists within themselves. Share just very, very quickly my favorite story about this, which is a study that was done, a psychology study that was done, of they took all of these subjects and they made them watch a six minute basketball game. They were told, the subjects were told, that the point of the study was to count how many baskets the white team made and how many baskets the red team made. Okay, easy. Six minutes, they watch, End of the game, they're given this question and answer. Question number one, how many baskets did the white team make? They all get it right. Question two, how many baskets did the red team make? They all get it right. Question three, did you notice anything else? 50% of the subjects said no. Turns out, that the actual point of the study is question. Because the point of the study is never what they tell you the point of the study is. And that halfway through the basketball game, this enormous gorilla had come out onto the basketball court, center stage, and had danced <laughs> in the middle of the basketball court. And more than half of them had missed it. Now. They hadn't napped, they hadn't sneezed, they hadn't stopped paying attention because they had correctly gotten all of the baskets. How did they miss an enormous dancing gorilla in the middle of a basketball court? And what we realized was, what all of the researchers finally realized was, simply because it wasn't what they were told to look for. It wasn't the instructions they were given. If they had been told, oh, and by the way, it's not really about the basketball game. Be sure to keep your eyes open because something else is going to happen. They saw it. And this is what happens in life, and this is what we have to be very aware of with our youth. We are told your job is get a good education, make a lot of money, Get a good, have a good career, have this type of marriage, have your white picket fence so many feet high. Not really what it's about. And so most of us miss it. And as parents, as teachers, as mentors, while we are helping them get a good education, get a good job, do all of these things of society, and there's nothing wrong with them, it's wonderful. But we need to simultaneously make sure they know 
this isn't what it's about. Keep your eyes open so you don't miss it. And we then will be able to be gardeners of the garden of today and tomorrow, of these extraordinary flowers and trees who are bursting forth with fragrance and color and fruit and life and who will be connected and courageous in that connection because they will know that their highest calling is just not to miss it. Somewhere along those same lines, right now at, at Agape International, there's a throng of young people that come to the community. And so we just started a millennial group. And they meet on a regular basis. And they live in a question of you know, what are they to bring to the community? You know, living in also in a question of what was to emerge in their own life. But what, what, they, what they want to, what, do, what, what are they to bring? And they could be a kind of classic. They don't have to live within the traditions of how agape has been. We're inviting them to bring in what's next to emerge through them. So it's challenging and it's scary because they're not in the tradition of 34 years of a community run a certain way, they're coming in with different ideas and what they want to do, and so we're creating, it's called an incubator, where they're incubating new ideas for themselves and new ideas for the community, and then to segue into to leadership as, as, as they deepen in their own spiritual practice and not miss what life is all about. So we're watching that happen, we're, we're, and, and more and more people are, uh, of the millennial age are coming into the community. The, the elders are still there. They're not going anywhere except for those who pass on. But this new energy is coming in and we're just welcoming it. We're just open to it. And they love what's happening. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a grand, great experiment to watch the next group of people come in. And we're, 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 we have our heads on and off at the same time. You know, on and off same time. It's, it's a very beautiful thing to watch. I'm fully awake that time is over, so I want to be very short, but I don't want to miss on... I cannot imagine any young person watching Michael today, and not Michael as a person, a personality, but just as an expression of genuine spirituality, which is not disengaging with the world, but one that is willing to fully engage from the truth of who we are. I look at the younger generation and I recognize they are the most essential. And at the same time, they are so... They know so good what they are against. They have social media, they see the bullshit in politics, in corporations, in environment, in what not, and they share but they really need to find the inspiration what they're for. They look at the world and it's pretty hopeless. None of them, there are so many, there is a phrase failing to launch. Nothing is meaningful. Pursuing careers, going to university, getting education in what? To be a corporate slave? It doesn't work for them anymore. But rather than being what they are against, coming into an environment that can inspire them what it is that we are for, and be part, be a leader, bring this incredible enthusiasm to join together, to co-create a reality that you can grow up your kids and celebrate on earth. So I will invite them to Agape, I will invite them to Global Days of Unity, I will invite them to Uplift.love because they will find the freedom to be empowered 
to discover their own expression, authentic expression, and to co-create the new rather than to fight the old. Welcome. Thank you. I would like to extend that invitation um, and invite you all to come to our 2.30 session where we're going to dive deep into the Global Days of Unity, which is, as Michael said, an evolutionary, evolutionary collaboration project. So I think you'll really love it, especially for young people. It's very, very, very fresh. So thank you all. We really appreciate it. This has been an amazing, amazing last session. Thank you all.